Hello, good evening and welcome to Our Front. My guest today is the longest serving Attorney General in the People's Republic of Ghana's history, and he should know that by now. He has also been one of the few individuals who doubled as not only Attorney General, Foreign Minister. He's also the first person to have occupied the seat of the NDC uh, leader after former President Jerry John Rawlings. My guest today is a non-conformist. His book has told you that before, if you've not read it. I'm sure by now you know who I'm talking about. Dr. Obedia Osamoa is my guest. We'll talk about lots of interesting things happening not only in the NDC, in the creation of regions, and happening in the country today. After this break. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. Today, our conversation is in one direction. It's to get the thoughts of a man who's been very phenomenal in Ghana's history, played varied roles from parliament straight down there to his role in the office as attorney general, longest serving. He at a point in time combined that position without the foreign minister, made very important decisions for and on behalf of this republic, and moved on to be the NDC's leader at a point in time. He left the biggest opposition party in Ghana today to go form another one, the Democratic Freedom Party, the DFP. In 2011, he rejoined the NDC. There were even calls on him to contest and still lead the party, even as of now. We'll talk to Dr. Obeda Samoa today. Doc, you're welcome to our front. Thank you. I hope you are doing well. Well, I'm surviving. Uh, but let's start from the, I mean, you've not been talking a lot this time. Why? You decided to go on the quiet? Well, I mean, at some point, one has to retire, really. I've been in politics for so long, and uh, I think this is about the time to, to relax and uh, to, to enjoy uh, life. And have you take retired? Care of, take care of your family. Have you retired? Not entirely, you know, even in politics. I mean, even when you, <laughs> when you, resi you decide to retire, yes. politics de decides not to retire you. So... <laughs> <laughs> the politics you never, is still keeping you. Yeah. Politics is still keeping me, yes. You are still on the NDC's Council of Elders. Yes. And that means you are still active in the party's affairs. To some extent, yes. Okay. Now, we'll come back to that particular political party and its dealings. But let's start with your most recent delivery, making people remember that the man, fire as usual, is still in the Republic. You've been talking about the creation of regions. But let's say the basis clear. One of the regions, Oti region, is where you come from. Yes. You are from Likpe <clears throat> in the Volta region. That's right. And that is going to be part, in fact, it's part of the traditional areas, four of them, that are supposed to be part of the Oti region today, isn't it? That's correct, yes. There's contestation on that matter. Your article sought to say that the respected chief and ch president of the National House of Chiefs cannot claim that all people in the Volta region should be allowed to vote when it comes to the creation of the OT region, how so? Well, because it is not born uh, out by historical experience or by the law as uh, it exists at the moment under Article 5 of the Constitution. Um, you know, if you look at the history, uh, the Volta region as it is now really is uh, uh, a conglomeration, more or less, of different territories. You had part of the original British Togoland, uh, you know, uh, as part of the Volta region. Then you had uh, the Anglo, Pekin, and Tongue areas added to the original uh, British Togoland to form uh, the Volta region. So, you know, but those areas, Anglo, Pekin, and uh, and Tom, for example, uh, were part of the Gold Coast colony. And they really did not become part of the Volta region until 1955, when the uh, British government brought them uh, into uh, the, uh, added them to British Togoland and created the Transvolta Togoland. Mm -hmm. And it was that act, act of 1955 which was the basis of, of an act of parliament passed by the Nkrumah government in 1959 to create the Volta region. Mm -hmm. Now, when Peki, Anglo, and others were brought to join uh, the uh, uh, original uh, British Togoland, uh, nobody, nobody asked the original British Togoland people whether they agreed to it. 
Nobody asked the people of the Gold Coast colony whether they agreed that those areas should be split from Gold Coast colony. You know. And when in 1957, uh, the uh, British Togoland was made to join Ghana following a plebiscite in 1956. Not a referendum. Well, they called it a plebiscite. You know, the, the British Togoland was being administered mm -hmm. as a trust territory okay. under Chapter 12 of the United Nations Charter. Mm -hmm. And it had different uh, principles of law uh, applying to that area. So when... If I will not interrupt you on yes. duty, there's a difference between the two, right? Between? A plebiscite and a referendum. Because yeah, the current they're, conversation... They're virtually, they're virtually the same because... It's, it's, the current conversation, some have asked that that distinction ought to be made to... No, you see, what's happened is that mm -hmm. in the case of the plebiscite, that was conducted by the United Nations. And by the uh, provisions of the United Nations Charter, one had to seek the views of the people with regard to their future. Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, they held that plebiscite. Now, so that one was controlled by international law. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, and it was the resolutions of the trusteeship council as well as of the general assembly that finally agreed that british togoland be joined to to uh, the gold coast uh, to form uh, ghana you know so what i'm saying is that in all these things people's consent were not was not sought except in the case of the british togoland yeah. because that was a requirement of international law i see you know but coming to ghana the, we, we, right now, the current law is the Constitution. And when you look at the Constitution, what it says is that uh, if uh, the, the, there is a petition presented to the president uh, and uh, uh, the president feels that there is a, a substantial body of opinion in support of that petition, then on the advice of the Council of State, the president is to appoint a commission of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Now, that Commission of Inquiry then ascertains the views of the people. And if the Commission of Inquiry thinks that there is a substantial need for uh, or, or support for the creation of the region, then that Commission of Inquiry will make two rep recommendations. One, with regard to the question to be posed at a referendum. And two, with regard to the area in respect of which the referendum can be held. So it is the commission that decides the question to be posed at the referendum and the area to be covered by it. So it's not automatic that everybody else can uh, uh, you know, express his consent. So if somebody says that the uh, areas not covered by OT region are also entitled to express their opinions on this, what is the basis of that? It's only if Brother the commission, consultation. If, if only the commission had recommended that, then they can raise their arguments. On but that. to be fair, would that not be a strict application or interpretation of the constitutional provisions in this case? Yes, but what's, what's wrong with that? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But you seem not to be amenable to the alternative interpretation which says that the general thinking in international law on this matter is pretty clear. There's that. no such general thinking in international law. And I've told you that the practice mm -hmm. in the Gold Coast has not supported that position. I mean, when the Anglos and the Pekis were brought to join British Togoland, there was no uh, 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 general public opinion. They did not ask the people of the Gold Coast colony whether they agreed that that part of the Gold Coast colony should be added to the British Togoland to form a Volta region. No. Is there, and the people, is there an express provision in the law that forbids the larger group in voting or determining this matter? No, there's no express provision. But the provision is that the Commission of Inquiry shall mm -hmm. determine that issue. It is within the jurisdiction of the Commission of Inquiry to determine the area to be covered by the referendum. That means that you, you can't add any other area that is not, uh, you know, recommended by the commission. I mean, you know, so is the general principle in this case not that the people affected are the ones who are supposed to vote? Yes. And therefore, 
the commission decides that the people who are going to belong to the OT region mm -hmm. are the ones who, to, uh, who should vote. And I'm telling you, that has been the practice. I, I get your point. Mm -hmm. But you don't seem to agree with those who say that nobody would be killed in this process. Nobody will suffer any losses at all if it's opened up. In fact, it will be more consultative. It will be more agreeable. And of course, modern democracy is built on consensus building, isn't it? But it is not based upon the Constitution. I mean, don't, don't let us flout the Constitution just because, you know, uh, you, know uh, uh, you want the general opinion. No, the Constitution is clear about how the opinions of the people should be determined. Would you agree that this split will affect all the other parts of the region? I don't know why it should affect them. It wouldn't? Why? If why should it affect the other parts of the region? The, the creation of OT region doesn't mean the creation of a new country. OT mm -hmm. region is still part of Ghana, you know. And regions have been created from time to time. Uh, and, uh, you know, what's the, what, what's the big deal? I really don't see what. You, you don't suspect that this is possibly a way that the people of the region have been divided? Well, any time there is a split of a region, like happened in the northern region and uh, we created the upper west region dur during the uh, PNDC era, yeah, there is a split. But uh, has it affected them? There are those who are of the opinion that there's a hidden political agenda. I don't know. I don't think there is any hidden political agenda. You're not that, open that to is, those. I mean, you are very no, experienced in politics. Yes, I think that if, indeed. You, in fact, <laughs> you, you don't think that there's possibly an attempt to do some form of redistricting to an advantage of a political party? No, I don't think so. Because, you see, if you, one of the arguments mm -hmm. of those who come particularly from the four traditional areas that you mentioned, yeah. Uh, 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 against the creation of the region is that they are saying, look, if you create the region, uh, you may have to create a constituency for the four traditional areas that you mentioned. That mm -hmm. is the Santrogofi, Akbafu, Lolobi, and Likwe. Likwe, yes. Now, if you create a constituency, that constituency would vote NDC because the M NDC, <laughs> you know, controls it. You know, so they are saying, some of them are saying, look, it's not going to benefit the government to create another constituency which would be an additional mm -hmm. NDC seat, you know. So now if the government is going to take steps that will create an additional NDC seat, seat that is not MPP, how can this be a parochial interest? Besides, you know, the, uh, we have a situation where this government, for example, wants to make, make the positions of all district chief executives elective. elective. Yeah. Now, it would have been better for them, wouldn't it? They could them elect an NDC, DC. Yeah, for them, it would have been better for them to keep the present position where they can appoint district chief executives even in areas which are controlled by the NDC. But when you make this, this position elective, the NDC is going to have district uh, chief executives in places controlled by them. Th no. There is this argument by a gentleman who accosted the president along the line in the UK. He confronted the president and said the president was virtually engaged in land grabbing. We are understanding of this concept. What does this mean and is it true? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what it means. What kind of land is the president grabbing? If he's uh, uh, you know, just creating a new uh, region, which is still part of Ghana, what land is he grabbing? Mm. I, really, I don't understand it. It really doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. We are at this point because some believe if the Justice Bobby Commission had made this report public, published it, uh, the report, we would have all been interested in the reasoning behind this particular justification for the creation. As I told you, this is not the first time there's been a request for the creation of regions. That would that be more appropriate if the Justice Bobo Commission published its report? In fact, we would all like to see the uh, report of that commission. Is I think it an anomaly be... that the report has not been published? Well, I, I don't know why it has not been published, but uh, I think it would be a good thing if the report were published. Do you think it will put some of the concerns being raised to rest? I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think there are some people, if you take the opposition is of two parts. Mm -hmm. You take the opposition of those areas which are not going to belong to OT region. Yeah. The publication of the uh, uh, commission's report <laughs> will not assuage them. <laughs> no. But 
it may assuage some of those who are to, be, to belong to the OT region, particularly those who are uh, in the OT region, particularly in the four traditional areas that we talked about, who are against it, are against it because they say there is no guarantee that when the region is created, they are going to be given a new district and a new constituency because they had originally belonged to the Jessican district. Yeah. And they were taken out of the Jessican district and given to Hohe. And now they are going to be, if they, they join the OT region, they will be out of Hohe district again. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go back to Jessica. Uh, so the only thing that would satisfy them would be if they get a new district and they get a new constituency. You know, so those people, they would only be happy if there is some assurance from government that a new district and a new constituency will be created for them. But government cannot assure them that, can they? No, because... I mean, for a district, yes, but for a constituency, government cannot determine that. No, well, I mean, the creation of constituencies is it's, it's always been subject to change. They can do that. Government yeah. can do it. But, but government will not be the, the one doing in this case. But the point it is the Electoral Commission's responsibility to do that. Yes. The creation of constituencies. Yes, that is so. But, I mean, government may have an interest in saying, look, would like to see that the constituency is created in such and such a place. An well, interest you insist will not amount to gerrymandering in any way? No, that, that's, that's not uh, what that would uh, amount to. You know, so what I'm saying is that if I want you to think of it, those that come from these four traditional areas that are opposed to the creation of OT region, and those in favor, really, the difference between them is, is not much. Because mm. it's, they are insisting that they want to see that the districts and the constituency are going to be created in the okay. first place. And in fact, they expect that to be done before the creation of OT region. Mm -hmm. Whereas the others are saying, okay, they would go for the OT region, but they will expect that after the creation of the region, they will get a new uh, district and a new constituency. So the difference isn't too great. It's a question of timing. Okay, yeah. it's, it's interesting to note that. But do we know how the commission determined the referendum where it should be held when its hearing did not cover the entire region? No, its hearing covered the areas mm -hmm. that are to be subject to the referendum. I mean, the, uh, the commission went around the areas. Yes, but it not the not entire go, region. Not a, no, because the, the entire region is not going to be part of the region. Okay, but could it be that the scope of the referendum was determined before the hearing? Possible? Does it sound reasonable to you? I, no, I don't know. I can't speak about that. I mean, I think we'll have to put that to the uh, commission. But I doubt very much that that was determined before the, uh, the commission went to work. Is it wrong for state institutions to work with the reports of this particular commission when it's not being published? Well, if they have copies of the reports and there are aspects of the, the report that concern them, there's no reason why they shouldn't work with, 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 the, uh, with, with the report. You know. But I think that it would be you know, good for all of us to really see what the report says. Now, I want to come to some other claims that have been made in all of this, which people believe they say creation of regions will not bring any development to the people if you did districts, and we have close to 254 now. The main justification for the creation of the regions today, when the MPP was campaigning prior to the 2016 election, was to bring development closer to the doorstep of the people. The contention is that districts are more likely to do that than regions. Okay, then let's abolish the regions as they exist now. Why will they accept the existence of regions now? Because if they think that districts are the vehicle by which development should be carried out, then but, let's abolish all the, uh, the but, regions. But have you been given reasoning that suggests that merely having regions in place will bring more development to the people? Certainly, it will localize the development in the sense that, for example, right now, mm -hmm. the development of the water region seems to be lopsided. A lot of the development is taking place in the southern part. And in the northern part, uh, you know, it uh, lacks a lot of the amenities that they should be having. Mm -hmm. Now, so if, for example, now, government is going to make available resources for the Volta region as a whole, they will have to divide the resources between two regions. 
Now, so, so part of the resources will now be localized in the OT region. And obviously, okay. there will be some development. Uh, th that, that's, that's the region. So if you, if you speak to your... But that's not the only reason. Th the th government likes also to bring uh, government closer to the people. You know, uh, it, it, you know when you have smaller regions, government is closer to the people. I see people and come from Kumasi, the Shanti region, to Accra to look for passports. They come to access basic services, even sometimes to chase a birth certificate. There's no guarantee that merely having another region would guarantee the people of Lake Pay these essential services. Well, but some of the services certainly will be uh, will, will come from the local area. Uh, it is true that with regard to passports and some of the other services, they are still centralized. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has been making efforts to decentralize the issue of passports. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, at last check, he was looking for money to create very effective regional offices that can do this properly. Yes. So part of it has been the problem of having adequate resources to do an effective uh, decentralization. But, the, the, but as time goes the, on. The, but the resources will not come automatically. Yes, but it's, as time goes on, when you have uh, uh, regions, those regions will be pressing for the resources, whatever there is, to be split so that they also benefit. So you're saying people that don't the, want the, the people of Lipe today they would only be able to press harder for resources when they join OT region. The people of Likwe by themselves yeah. cannot, be, cannot really make that much of uh, an impact. That's, that's they, the point here. But they can make it within the context of a region. You see, imagine that the people of Likwe want to some kind of particular development. Mm -hmm. now, if the regional administration also is supporting that administration, because ultimately, to make a request to government, you've got to do it through the local government system. You do it through the district, the district carries the, uh, the request to uh, the region, and the region carries the request to, to government uh, at Accra. So if you, don't have, if you don't have a local government system through which you can pass, you have a great problem. You come to Accra here and try to reach uh, uh, mm. uh, 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 the president or go and reach a, a minister, without going through the regional administration or the district administration, you have a problem. You, no, nobody will mind you. Now, let me ask you this question. You are Attorney General. When you were Attorney General, was there ever proposals like this before the government? For the creation of... Uh, yeah, region, yes, during, I, was in the, I was a member of the PNDC. Yes. And during the era of the mm. PNDC, there was also a petition for the creation of, uh, of, of OT region. The petitions, you know, there have been several petitions for the creation of the region. Uh, over the years. So why didn't the PNDC create these regions? Well, at that time, our priority really was to try to resuscitate the economy generally. You know. well, why so, do you think that is necessary now? Because right now, I think the, the pressure is mounting, and we've got a situation where, for the first time, uh, the political opinion uh, of the major parties converge. The NDC and the MPP both agreed that OT region be created. So the situation is more ripe than, it, uh, than before. Mm. Now, the understanding many also have about the creation of regions and its attendant issues is that it brings up, and some have raised this, old ethnic boundaries and uh, issues that sometimes, in Chirponi, for example, whether or not part of Triponi or the entirety of that particular district is supposed to be part of it. It's very contentious. The traditional area says no way. But the people, some of them, led by the DC, has informed the group to advocate for more of these. Are we not inflaming likely volatile ethnic tension that cement down for a very long time? I don't think so. In any case, ethnicity is still a factor in Ghana's politics. And let's face it, people act as a tribe, mm -hmm. and they pursue the tribal interests. That, that continues to exist. But that's not what government should promote, right? It's not that government is promoting it, but government has to recognize the needs of the people. You know, it's not that you're promoting tribalism, but if a particular tribe needs to be served with a particular purpose, government, there's no reason why government should ignore that only because it is a tribe that is asking for it. This claim that certain groupings within regions are, not, are being underserved, 
Is there empirical evidence to support it? Well, I mean, if you take the case of the water region. Yes. If you go to the south and then travel to the north, mm -hmm. <laughs> the evidence is very clear. I mean, at least in terms of roads, for example. And this is not just because you are from there? No, not because I'm from there, no. Because it's some have accused you of that. They say that the only claim, the only basis for this, your support and your, your defense of same is because of your affinity with the people. No, I just want to see more development in, 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 in the In region. your hometown? Yeah, not only my hometown, but in all the areas of the Oti region. And of course, that is not to say that development in the southern part should cease. And that should also continue. We'll take a break. After this break, we'll continue our conversation, folks, on the creation of virgins and other essential matters that one of our best brains in this country, Dr. Obadi Samoa, has thoughts on. Ghana's first and only 24 hour news channel, Joy News, presents Joy News Prime, a news bulletin that lets you know all you need to know human interest, politics, business, showbiz, and sport. We've got it all covered on Joy News Prime at 7 p.m. Joy News Prime is seen right across Ghana, West Africa, and beyond, and in Europe. Joy News Prime, bringing the news together from all over. Every morning could become a great day and we have what it takes to make it happen. We update you with the news. Take you along with our roving reporters for daily live location experience with stories that matter. Bad order. Very bad one. Following from the, the littering of the, the cameraman can just um, zoom in and see it. Your day is not complete without answers to the tough questions you want answered. But if you don't get the funds to execute the project, would you also be honest to tell us? Oh yes. Ah, I'm not a Ghanaian. Me, I'm a Muslim. I swore by the Quran. We also serve you the AM business, sport and entertainment from the heart of the city. The AM show is worth waking up for. There can't be a weekend without football news, cracking games, player matchups, hearty arguments on the streets, campuses, pubs, in offices, and even at home. Well, it's been hard lately to follow because of your busy shuttle, but there is no excuse if you miss out Touchline on the Joy News channel on Multi TV at 5:30 p.m. on Fridays and at 2:30 p.m. on Saturdays. Your most sacred 30 minutes of sports. Touchline previews key games, provides you with a weekend's fixture guide, and even the neutrals are not left out. With Spot on interviews with your celebs from all fields. I'll record to a touchline. 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 Touchline, touchline with George Adam Jr. Touchline is on TV, online, and Facebook. Join us next. The weekends cannot pass without watching Touchline. Touchline. You welcome back. This is Upfront. My name is Raymond Alqua. My guest today is Dr. Obed Yao Asamoah. And uh, Dr. Asamoah is a former Attorney General in this republic. I'm sure by now you know the longest serving. He served in that position together with being Foreign Minister at a point in time. He was also a former chairman of the NDC. He left the party, returned in 2011. In October, just around this same time, he returned to the party. We'll be talking about the NDC pretty soon, but... We're talking about the creation of regions. He's put up perhaps the biggest defense from any opposition party member to it. But this defense that you put up to the OT region and the response to the president of the National House of Chiefs, was it your own opinion or we can say it reflects that of the NDC too? Well, I, uh, it was to some extent my own opinion. I, and I, I felt that in fact the NDC should have been very actively involved in this uh, exercise. The minority uh, doesn't feel so. Yeah, but the point is this, you see. A press conference a couple of days ago yeah. was saying that there's a problem with the creation of the regions. Yes, but the point is this, that the OT region will be created anyway, with or without these traditional areas that are complaining. Mm -hmm. Because apart from the four traditional areas that we talked about, that is the... Uh, 
Santrokofi, Akpafu, Lolobi, and Lekwe, apart yeah. from that, the rest of the, uh, of, of the Oti region are solidly in favor of it. So it will be created with or without those traditional areas. Now, when it is But there are barriers. I'm sure you know that. Th th there's a certain number of people required to vote for it. Yes. There's a oh, certain yes. percentage yes, that they required that to, be to be present to do the voting. That is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. You have to have, I think, a, an 80% yes. uh, 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 presence. And then uh, over 50 or something, 60 or something percent. It's 50% 50 50, present, 80% uh, voting uh, for it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, so that, that is so. But what I believe that for... Exclude, if you exclude the four traditional areas where there is controversy, I believe that the, the, they can achieve the figures. The rest of the area will achieve the figures. So they will create the region with or without. And I'm saying that, look, when we created uh, Upper West Region, it mm -hmm. had political consequences. Yeah. The Upper West Region, that is the area now that is Upper West, was really the heartland of the Dankwa Bozia tradition. That's true. You know, that is where the Jato Kalios and all the these other SD elements. Dombos. Dombos. That's yeah. where, that where they, they came from, mm -hmm. you know. But when... You are accused of uh, clearly seeking, among other things, for political reasons to do this. The same accusations this government is being... No, but at, at that time, we were not in uh, uh, an atmosphere but of the party political, politics. the political traditions were there. Yes, the pol political traditions were there. Mm -hmm. But the region was created because of the demands of the people and because of convenience of administration, uh, you know. So it's, uh, I wouldn't say that one did that for any poli particular political advantage because the PNDC was not in office as a result of the voting uh, by, uh, uh, or support of any particular party. But it did have consequences okay. for the political parties mm. because when that region was created, their allegiance changed. Mm -hmm. You see, it changed and they supported the people NDC. created the region. Yes, the people created the region. Yeah, the, people they created, the people created the region and the people who, set, who <laughs> instigated the setting up of yeah. the NDC. Yeah. So it had political consequences. Now, for to the, the advantage end, of the people. The, to the, no, what I mean is this it had political consequences for the political parties. Mm -hmm. You see, now, if OT region is set up with, with let us say, opposition from the NDC. Mm -hmm. Will the NDC be surprised if the allegiance of the people changes uh, in support of the MPP? We have a, we have a, a precedent. Yeah, because that's happening. So people before. must learn from history. Yes. So for me, I thought that the, since our leaders in the 2016 campaign had all committed themselves to the creation of the OT region, the NDC should be actively involved in the creation the so not, that it is not seen like this is just the work of the MPP. By way of clarification, the idea they are not opposed to, and they have referenced why it was in the manifesto in the first place, mm -hmm. they are saying that there are constitutional breaches in the quest, in how the creation is being done. And their specific reference in this case is that, and this is Minority Leader, he says it is for political and ethnic motives. That is how these regions have been created. So where is the uh, breach of constitution? I am concerned with what the constitution says. If he says that what the government is doing is not constitution, I would like to see the argument. I really don't see it. I really don't see it. I mean, and that's not the only thing they are saying. They say they will fight the creation of the regions until it is done the right way. They okay. will do everything possible to prevent that from happening. Well, in the case of OT region, mm -hmm. if they do everything possible to prevent it happening, they should remember the consequences of what happened with the creation of uh, uh, upper West. So, I mean, really. Sometimes, All you know, let me tell you. that those look, who create regions benefit from their regions. Yeah. Their so, regions tend to, so why don't tend you, to why pay don't, them back. Why don't you want to be associated with the creation so you also benefit? But how are you going it to make it that way? Of course, if, you are, if the NDC mm -hmm. also associates itself with the creation of OT region, then the MPP cannot claim that they are the only ones who created it and therefore expect that there will be some kind of uh, political advantage they will get. You know, this is it. So, and we, if we learn from the creation of Upper West Region, we should be able to, uh, to see the consequences of NDC being opposed. But let me tell you something but they also, also. Let me tell you, you something. See, the interesting part is that they also think that you are wrong 
In fact, they believe that it is narrow interpretation of the constitutional provisions on this particular matter. That leads anybody in thinking that the affected areas are only the people who are directly going to be changed. Well, they can take a narrow, uh, uh, they can take a wider interpretation. I take mm -hmm. a narrow interpretation. They are all legitimate, but it's up to the courts to determine. So let them go to court and say, we don't agree, our interpretation is so and so and so. I don't think that they'll win that kind of case. And, and to be I, fair, there are close to five different challenges on this matter before the courts of the Republic of Ghana today. I don't, I can't, I don't want to go into the yeah, merits yeah, of these cases. Of course, cases. I mean, I'm not even uh -huh. asking that uh -huh. you do that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't support those cases. But I want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. That locally, in the OT region, yeah. all the NDC MPs are in support of the creation of the region. Did they say that to you? I saw them at the commission. I, I was at the commission. Let, let, I let went me. to Suta, for example, okay. when the commission mm -hmm. met there. And all the MPs in that area were there in support. And but there's a minority that represents all MPs. And the minority that represents all MPs. Yes. I mean, As in all, all minority MPs. MPs. All the, not all the well, the minority MPs, yes. uh, NDC MPs. Yeah, NDC you MPs. Know? The yeah. minority that represents all of them. Yes. So even if they support it, they've not voiced this kind of support openly like their, their leader is doing. And I want to believe that they are in support of their leader, rather. But they, 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 are, they are in favor of those local mm -hmm. NDC leaders are in favor of the creation of the region. But they, in you are principle, saying that but are they opposed to the issues that have been raised by the minority? Do they still think there's political motive? Do they still think that there's ethnic motive? Do they still think that the, the voting should be done by the entire region, not a section? Those, are, I don't those know. are very different from supporting the general idea. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, quite frankly, I think that the minority leader, if he's making these statements, he's misguided. He really doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? This is maybe because of the particular problems in the northern region. Mm -hmm. You may feel that, uh, you know, the creation of uh, these regions is, uh, it creates problems. Yeah. You know? yeah it may probably creates problems for the NDC in the, in the northern region. I'm not, I haven't studied that situation. Okay. But I think that with regard to OT region, I think it is in the interest of the NDC to be in support. Let's move on to other issues, um, still because we started talking about the NDC. What's the state of the party today? I mean, of course, you are a member of the Council of the Elders. The, there's been a struggle recently. They have elected youth and women leaders. Very soon, they'll be electing national, uh, what they call it, leaders of the party. Do you think that the current leaders who are still contesting and wishing to be retained should be retained? Well, the choice is always the choice of the people. So anybody can seek office. If you get the support of the majority, you are the one who leads the party. When I spoke to you about the quest by Dr. Dr. Kamenejie, who replaced you for re-election, you were heavily opposed to it. What has changed? Nothing has changed. You now say I, that people should decide, which yeah. is really what they did previously. Yes. But you were clearly in your mind that he had failed and you could not be maintaining the position. Yeah, because that was my assessment of the situation. That is not to say, therefore, mm -hmm. that the majority should not vote for him. Oh, that's interesting to vote. <laughs> <laughs> I get your point. <laughs> you know. In this case, for example, has, has a you, I, was, I, I was, uh, you know that I did not support the uh, uh, candidature of Professor Mills. Yeah, you didn't at all. I, I did not, mm -hmm. you know, because I, you know, I had my own uh, feelings that, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't be able to deliver. On hindsight, the, you are wrong, yeah. right? Well. I don't know whether I'm wrong. Or no, not. but now you should know because the he's passed. Yeah. There is also another precedent on her side. You should be able to tell me whether you are right or wrong. Well, I think I prefer, because he's now a, a dead person, I prefer not to get into this. Uh, this uh, okay, I mean, this I think discussion. that's a fair deal. I get your point. Mm -hmm. Now, let me get this also straight. The current leadership of the NDC, have they failed or they have delivered? At least they could not maintain political power, that's for sure. Yes, they couldn't, but I think uh, apart from the fact that perhaps some of the policies that they promoted during the general election in 2016 did not resonate with the people. Look, the majority of the voters in this country are between 18 and 35. Yeah, youthful. Yeah. These are the ones who are the uh, G, um, what is it, senior high school types. Mm -hmm. These are the ones who are the nurses. 
-hmm. These are the ones who were the teachers. Mm -hmm. In all those fronts, the policy of the government was not recept I mean, was not acceptable. Counseling, training yes, allowances. Yes, counseling, uh, training allowances and that sort of thing. And but why is the, why why is the MPP, why is the MPP was uh, 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 trying to promote uh, free SHS, mm -hmm. uh, we were not supporting it. Now, if you are an, an NDC parent and you have the opportunity to send your child to school without pain, and somebody has uh, your own people are saying, no, the, you, when you go, you have to pay. Will you vote for the NDC person? It doesn't make rational choice sense. Yeah, I mean, but, so, but, I mean, really, but to be they, fair, they, that's, so, so, that's also saying, to presume that Ghanaians vote on rational choice. Well, doesn't really much of them support that. Maybe they? not all vote on rational choices, but yes. some people obviously do. Mm, okay. And you know, we, I mean, with the economic conditions we have in this country, oh, okay. I That's think people true. who have the opportunity to have well, their kids go to school for free <laughs> would opt for that. Uh, but forgive you know. me, in this case, you can't blame party for it. This is pure government policy, not party policy. No, it was the the, the MPP yeah. as 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 a party was promoting that before they got into government. No, I'm saying that the NDC is what I'm talking about now. Yeah. I was asking you to evaluate the leadership of the party. Yes, For their inability to maintain power, have they failed? And I'm telling you, they didn't maintain power mm -hmm. because they lost the election, isn't it? Yes, that's true. And they lost the election because the policies did not resonate with the people. That's what I'm trying to tell so you. So the problem was one with the government and not the party? The problem was both government and party because the government was obviously... Uh, you know, uh, expressing mm -hmm. the policies of the, of, of the party. So, you know, so Doc, I think that to the extent that they were not able to. But let me make another point. Very good. Yes, that. the other point is this: that we must see that there has been a bit of a pattern mm -hmm. in the voting in this country, whereby a party gets about eight years in office. Yeah, yeah. And you know, by the time of the 2016 elections. The NDC had had eight years, had four years of Professor Mills and four years of uh, President Mahama. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a that factor also. Oh, okay. You know, that also accounted for the uh, automatic for, 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 turnover of eight years. Yes, I mean, I think that the people of this country have kind of kind of established a practice <laughs> that <laughs> we can't exceed eight years. Yes, that you know, will give you eight years. They think four years is a little Even too short. Even the human beings who are contested election are different. So Mahama still had four years left. No, it because they look at it in terms of the party. Parties. Okay, interesting. Yes, you see. Mm. So I think that is another, that is the factor. other factor, yes. But know, that's so. also beyond the party's leadership's control. That one is beyond the party's could, leadership. Could they have devised a communication way to deal with it more appropriately? Well, I don't know. I, I, I think it would be difficult, really. To do it that I mean, for example, you see, if uh, after 80 years of the MPP, uh, they still win an election, that would be a... Uh, strange. That would, that would be strange, yes. I'll can that happen? I'll, I'll, it can happen, but then it really has to be an exceptional circumstance because you know people, people sometimes just want change, and it's human nature. You said yeah. uh, after eight years of the NPP, it presupposes that there's some natural sequence that they should go for eight years. Well, that I'm saying that if they should go for eight years, okay, they, they will not be able. To, it's not likely that they can go beyond the eight years. Should this yeah. government go for eight years? Can they win the next election? Well, I don't know. We, are, we all wait to see. Will they the win the next election? Well, I don't know. I can't tell. Will the NDC win the election? I don't think I can tell that the NDC can win the next election. But you're a member of the Council of Elders. You should be bold enough to be able to say that we will win the election no. because we are prepared. We are competent enough to come back. I'm a very experienced politician and I'm practical. And I don't go for wild guesses. Okay. That, but let me bring in this point to Now, we know that the General Secretary is still contesting. Is he likely to maintain this position from where you sit? Well, from the look of things, I think, mm -hmm. I think he's, he's a leading contender. He's actually going against Koku Anido, who was his deputy, yes. who was President Mills' spokesperson at, at some point in time. Yes. Is he not formidable enough to replace a syndicate that has been there for a very long time? No, I mean, I'm, I'm just judging by the sentiment, I think, okay. the predominant sentiment, you know. I'm not saying that Kokua Nyindoho is not competent or, yeah. you know, but uh, it I, doesn't I that think the way, the, way, the way it looks to me is that a is, is leading in, mm. in, in, the, in the race. Are you worried <laughs> that a huge number of people are contesting the, the flag bearership race this time around? Yes. <clears throat> in fact, uh, you know, at the time that I was in office, mm -hmm. 
we did everything possible to reduce the numbers. Mm -hmm. So we used to have a policy of having a slate, mm -hmm. you know, which has, that policy is now no longer operative. Mm -hmm. And so everybody is jumping into the, uh, into the race. Should something to be done about this number? Well, I would have liked to have a situation where we could have pruned down the number. How can that be done? Oh, it can be done by, you know, the executives and the Council of Elders coming together uh, and ha developing a common policy. But it is late now. It is late now to do that. It should have, uh, the, this should have been done much earlier. Right now, it is difficult. Because they can't people, negotiate with them? No, it's not difficult because people have spent a lot of money campaigning and the rest. And now, if you want them to withdraw... Officially, there are no candidates yet. Officially, there are no candidates yet. There are candidates for the executive positions. Yeah, the, no, no, I'm not talking, talking about, about the, the flag bearer. The flag bearer one. Well, <clears throat> I think there are candidates because they have you know, expressed interest. So they're written official to express interest. Yes. Yeah. Well, Is it too late still? I think I think it's, it's too late. How about because the quality they are, of the they are they are already in the field campaigning. Mm. Now. <clears throat> Is this injurious to the unity of the party going forward? The huge numbers. The MPP mm. had almost 17, around 2008, and they lost after that. Some attribute that particular uh, defeat partly to the fact that the party after <coughs> the 17 uh, member uh, flag bearer race became very divided. Is the NDC likely to suffer a similar uh, fate? Yeah, but I hope that the NDC has the capacity to overcome the divisions after one person has emerged as, as a leader. And I believe they do have that capacity. To overcome that? Yes. Is it going to be a tough race from the look of things? I mean, in terms of uh, who leads the party? Yes. Well, I think it uh, looks like uh, President Mahama is uh, very much ahead. Really? Yeah, it looks to me like he is. Your equally experienced <coughs> friends and colleagues, Victor Beho um, and others, especially from your region, have been very bold in throwing their support behind Professor Alabi. Some of them think that President Mahama has squandered his chance. He should let somebody else lead the party with a fresh face, fresh integrity, and fresh <coughs> record so that the party can be seen as new and have a brighter chance in the next election. What do you think about that? Well, you can have a unanimity of views. I mean, <laughs> yes, of course, you can all agree. Yeah, so mm. you know, they're entitled to their opinions. But so that I'm clear in your mind, when you say that President Mahama is in the lead in this particular case, this is based on sentiments you paid on the grounds or something more than that? Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, it's based on sentiments I picked on the ground. And the fact that, you know, a lot of the leadership, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in a political party, you have people occupying all kinds of positions. Yeah. Uh, uh, at the constituency level, at the district level, at the regional level, national level. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that the uh, predominant opinion is in support of... Uh, Former President Rowling is a very big individual in the NDC. He's great. He's huge. He doesn't seem to support Former President Mahama. Indeed, he's made <coughs> comments that suggest that there should be fresh leadership of the NDC to give it the credibility to run in the next election and have a brighter chance. Yeah, but uh, it's not enough just to say so. Which fresh leadership is he thinking about? She let us know. Then we'll assess. But the examples, there, there's Pro Gabriel, there's Professor Alabi, there's Gusitano. These are also people who have been around for some time. Yeah, I mean, they are, they're, not, uh, they're not new. You know, I would like to see that. No, no, I, would like to see him, I would like to see him say, Mr. So and so is fresh uh, material, and it's, we should give him a chance. Mm -hmm. and then we all, you know, probably decide whether we support that idea or not. But when you say fresh leadership, which fresh leadership is there? He accused the former administration, John Draman Mahama administration, of being <coughs> corrupt, of supporting corruption, of not being willing to deal with corruption. Were these allegations legitimate and true? I don't know. He must have his evidence. You know, I, I, I don't know. I can't tell. Should he provide but, that? Well, I think that when you make allegations, mm -hmm. you should support the allegations with facts. Mm. Now, the <coughs> candidates, five of them, Professor Alabi and co, have actually come together. And they are saying they are going to make demands on the party leadership. Especially through also the Council of Elders. 
that please, it doesn't look like the current leadership is neutral when it comes to how the election is going to run for flag bearership. They want the processes fair, a level playing ground, so that they can be justified that the right leader has been elected by the people and reflects the general will of the people. Are these concerns legitimate? Has it come to the Council of Elders? Well, you know, there are some people who are anxious to have the election of the flag bearer mm -hmm. very early. Yeah. You see? Uh, and to some extent, they have the support of the Constitution because the Constitution says that you should uh, elect a flag bearer two years before the general election. You see? But, you know, the current executive has kind of uh, lived beyond its lifespan. And you're going to have a new executive in December. And ideally, is the new executive that should manage mm. the election of a flag bearer. Yeah. Not the old executive. But does it look like that's going to happen? It doesn't look like it, you see. So some people are kind of pushing mm -hmm. to try to get the election early. And therefore, you're likely to have the old executive whose time or, or whose lifespan really has, uh, 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 has expired, expired going to manage that process. That doesn't look good for the party, but I believe that is what is likely to happen. Now, my other question to all of this is, can the NDC emerge out of these internal struggles and be able to mend its ways, make sure that it is united for 2020? Well, I believe that they can do that. But you but don't think always that the party be, will win the election? Well, I don't know. I don't, it's very difficult to... to, to uh, is that it's to, too to early? It's, it's, it's too early to judge that. I think that uh, I mean, the President, uh, President uh, Kufuado has only had two years mm -hmm. in office. He has, uh, he's got another two years to go. I mean, people are saying, for example, the economic conditions are difficult. Mm -hmm. The cost of living is hard. Yeah. But he's, he's not a fool. He, 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 I mean, just by the time of the election, he'll try to soften things. And that's what I'm coming to now. How is the president performing? I think on some uh, fronts, he's, he's performing well. I like asked, specifically? I asked, for example, the issue, the issue of the free uh, SHS. SHS okay. I support it. There are challenges, mm -hmm. but those challenges should not undermine the, the, the policy. The policy is good. So we should try and see how we can overcome those challenges. Now, I support uh, his, um, uh, his actions on... Uh, this Galamse business, oh, okay. know, the, the, the destruction of the environment, mm -hmm. you know, he was bold to do it. You know, most uh, uh, other leaders didn't, didn't have that courage. Mm -hmm. And uh, his uh, fighting vigilantism, you he, know, he? was to some extent, yes. I mean, they, they've, they've dealt with some of their own people, uh, vigilante elements who have been lawless. I don't think that uh, the NDC can claim that kind of credit. Because they really? were, yeah, of course, the NDC also have, have had some uh, vigilante elements. Mm -hmm. For example, during the last election, you remember what happened once yes. to President Akufuado mm -hmm. near his residence. Yeah, some true. elements, uh, you know, the more, Nima, yes, in Nima, yes, in Yeah. Well, the government of the day should have taken firm action against those people. Mm -hmm. They didn't. But this government the government is of the day, the government of the day was NDC. They should have taken firm action. Uh, I believe that uh, he is taking some action against some of the elements in this party who are lawless. Corruption. Think, corruption always exists. <laughs> Matt, that made this appointment as special prosecutor. Step in the right direction? It is. It, it is a step in the right direction. He's done he's nothing a, up to today. Well, no single he prosecution. Is not, he is not, he's he's uh, complaining about not having resources. Yes. The, the, the office has not been set up properly. Uh, I believe that when it is set up properly with all the facilities that it needs and uh, and if the evidence is provided, I believe that he can perform. We are two years into the administration. You yeah. seem to think that generally this government has done well. Well, in some areas, they have not done too well. I mean, let's face it. Especially the cost of which living, areas? Cost of living, cost of living is high. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. I mean, really, cost of living is high. Petrol prices are going up and that sort of thing. It's, uh, that is not, uh, uh, that's not something that uh, any taxpayer <laughs> no, will be excited uh, about. Yeah, yeah. So, but... On these other fronts that I've mentioned, uh, I think that they do have my support. Doc, are you supporting any for the national chairmanship race? Of the party? Yes. No, for now I am neutral. For now you are neutral? Yes. It is likely to change in the future? It, it can, the picture can change. I appreciate your time today, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you joined us today. We should be speaking more. Okay. Anytime. Thank you so much, Doc. Well, folks, that's where we... 
tie the nice ribbons on today's edition of Affront. My name is Raymond Alkwa. My guest has been Dr. Obeda Samoa.